So, yes, here we are again. Pop-up submissions has just popped with five submissions, two extraordinary guests, one somewhat eccentric literary agent with a very odd taste in dodgy shirts. Let me introduce you, without further ado, to our Litopian guest of the week, Ali G is in the house. <laughs> Hello, good Ali. Good evening. Hello. I'm sorry. How are you? <laughs> it's good to see you. We haven't seen you for a long time. I know. It's been ages. I thought it, it has been banned. ages. I'm wondering if it, possibly you said something vile on, on the last show that got you banned. <laughs> it must have been something truly dreadful. It must, have, must have been. Must have been. Yeah. What's, Any what's holiday reading for us? <laughs> As if I don't even know. I said something that ghastly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can only um, hope yeah. you do the same again. <laughs> Um, yes, I brought you Bill Bryson, oh. uh, Shakespeare, which is actually a very interesting read. And, and I know a bit about Shakespeare, I suppose everybody does. Um, but he goes into quite how little we really know about him, uh, apart mm. from his literary work, and, and debunks quite a lot of the myths. You know, the whole, actually it was Kit Marlowe who wrote it, or you know, oh, yeah. the Duke of Lester. I think, and also the, the list of the that means nothing. <laughs> I mean, stop. That means absolutely nothing. That Shakespeare wasn't actually, actually written by Shakespeare. Who cares? It's still Shakespeare. <laughs> exactly, Insane. Yes, exactly. It still carries the same badge. So no, yeah, it's fascinating. Read. Very, uh, very interesting. Good fun, and just carries you along. So That's I recommend brilliant. it. Brilliant. Fantastic recommendation. Thank you very much. In the other window, it's it's pop up submissions. Favorite children's publisher <laughs> of the week. <laughs> Oh, I quickly said. Oh. <laughs> In fact, our only children's publisher of the week is Kessie. It's so, stop it. Stop it. Stop, thank you. It's so nice to have you back. How are you? Oh, thank you. I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. And you've just been published, haven't you? Yes, for the second time, which is yeah. extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, you're a twofer now. We'll talk about that in a moment. Right now, give us our um, summer book recommendation, please. So I am recommending The Hunting Party, which is uh, the book that has broken my four-month-long uh, reading slump from, oh. from lockdown. Um, it is absolutely amazing, obviously, um, but particularly very gripping, which I think is what sort of got me through it. You, you just really have to carry on reading and find out mm. who was killed and who did it. So wow. it's, it's incredible. Um, they're calling her the New Agatha Christie's. Is that accurate? Yeah, very, very modern take on an Agatha Christie sort of locked room mystery type thing, yeah. although it isn't a locked room. But yeah, I can, I can definitely see the... Well, nice the and comparison. accessible, not too highbrow for summer? No, perfect, perfect register. It's just accessible enough, but it also feels like it's got some kind of meat to it. So yeah, great. perfect. Excellent. Coming from you, Kessia, it's a great recommendation. Uh, this is where we stand on submissions, 26th of April. We have made a little bit of progress. We're trying. We are. Honestly, we're trying. And I should tell you um, as well that Priority Pop-Up Submissions is now open because we've got our new website uh, running. So if you can't wait that long, for reasons best known to yourself, you can jump the queue. Let's have a look and see what the results from last week were. Will gave us a postman's guide to monster hunting. Andrew gave us an uplifting murder. Debbie gave us surfing in the dark. Jordan gave us 11.22. And Rayona, secret skin. That latter one had its admirers. No question about that. But this is how the show ended last week. I think the postman's guides to monster hunting, I think... Um I might even bump that to a five, to be fair. They, uh, the, the I don't know if we should allow Sarah to change her vote like that. I guess we ought to, but it's going to be your call. She has. Yeah, and we did allow, in fact, our, our wonderful bookers, in fact, allowed Sarah to change her vote. And that's a precedent. It's not just changing the vote, it's changing the rules. We're going to allow that at the end, as you'll see, of this show. Um... So the overall conclusion was 90% of the chat room, me, Sarah and Andy, all were voting in favour of a postman's guide to monster hunting. And I have to say, it was a pretty strong week in terms of submissions, but none of that counts for anything compared to what you thought. And this is how you voted. Yeah. Look at that. Ab 
absolutely unanimous. We all liked it. Actually, I think we all loved it, in fact. The new Douglas Adams. That's what people are saying. Do you think we're going to find something equally strong and memorable this week? I don't know. Let's find out. Hi, my name's Peter Laws, and I'm the author of the crime fiction series featuring Matt Hunter, and it's fantastic to be here on Pop-Up Submissions. Now, here's a writing tip. Uh, I would say get perspective. Realize that writing isn't the most brilliant, most important thing in life. Before I became a writer, I used to see published authors and think, oh my goodness, if only I could be in that world. And now that I'm in that world, it's fantastic and it's wonderful, but it is not the be all and end all. It's, it's, it's a job like anything else. So try and get perspective, I would say. Uh, that's important. Well, that's Peter Laws, who is also a reverend a vicar. This is our first submission. It's epic fantasy, and it's from William Brian Johnson. There's a QR code, so you can scan that, go straight to it. I don't know where it is, by the way. It's a website, you know, whatever website William wants you to go to. And it's called The Dark Cry of Aristid. Aristide? No, Aristid. And this is William's blurb. In the small northern frontier of Elta, a late summer storm wipes out the crop and livestock. A midwife turns to forbidden magic and unleashes the full power of the magistrate upon the people. Can they survive the oncoming winter, an inquisition, and what the magic has awakened? An ancient forest god protects a chosen few during the endless winter nights. Thank you very much for that, William. Let me tell everybody about you. Um... Brian, you call yourself Brian. I call you Brian too, actually. Uh, author, photographer, storm chaser. Dangerous work there. An educator living in the Midwest of the United States. That's all we need to know. It's more than enough. So we thought it would be rather good to get Pop-Up Submission's very own verbal storm chaser. Do you see how I did that? To read it. Here's Kate. Dark page. Cry of Aristid by Brian. Read by Kate. The man who burned witches alive stood before Mayor Herrick Blanchfield's desk with an ominous warning. Your daughter has been seen again in Shrine Hall, Mayor Blanchfield. Overseer Daniels stopped after addressing him, almost like the title was too bitter for his taste. The law of the Tower is that no child shall enter Shrine Hall without an adult, even yours. The Temple of Asagrim is not a playground. He leant forward over the desk. This is your final warning. Overseer Daniels, the head of the tower and the head of a small group of knights stationed in Elta, stood less than a foot away. He had a way of looming over the villagers, making sure his shadow fell across them while terrifying them into submission. Overseer Daniel's pale blue eyes fell on Herrick, almost eagerly awaiting the incorrect response. It made Herrick sit up straight in his office chair. He had a short stature, pudgy, middle-aged. He adjusted his glasses, cleared his throat, prepared to speak to the head of the White Citadel. My apologies, Overseer. My wife and I will make the Overseer left without another word. Herrick held his breath until he exited. No warning or excuses next time. By the gods, all this and nearing harvest too. He slumped in his chair. A couple of knights marched past his office on their regular patrol. He checked to make sure they didn't deposit a squirming red-headed girl not more than six winters old at the office door. Herrick grabbed his cloak and locked up. The village worked at its normal pace as villagers rushed around in the late summer heat, gathering provisions for supper. The aroma of warm bread filled the streets, and spiced meat soon overpowered it, making his stomach grumble. He strode around the village square, visiting the different vendors, while keeping a wary eye out for his wayward daughter. Some stopped him to offer a hello or to complain about a knight's heavy-handedness or outright abuse. The White Citadel moved half of the Tower Knights to the front lines of a war that lasted longer than the Elder's memory. In their absence, the remaining knights grew merciless. 
A year had passed since Herrick was elected as village mayor and the complaints against the Knights began. His election almost caused an armed response from the Tower because their puppet, a man named Loach, was voted out and disappeared that night. In his absence, the Tower sought revenge. Unfortunately, it was revenge against their people. Herrick crossed the village down to the lower part of the valley. The debate had started early today. In front of their shops, Val Deer, a worn, soot-covered blacksmith, and red-headed Rhinefast, the brash butcher, debated outside their shops. Scraps, Ranfast's massive weathered wolfhound, ran circles among the two, releasing a low, gruff growl until Ranfast threw him a bone. They remained friendly, but sometimes their arguments spun out of control and ended in fists and an occasional dog bite. Other times a knight ventured nearby, making Ranfast back off his anti-tower rants. Odd that both of their shops were closed so early. They're usually not outside until dark. The air seemed colder, heavier down here in the valley. Thunder rumbled off in the distance, making Herrick look to the mountains. The sky, pockmarked with fluffy clouds, appeared the bluest in memory. Deep blue, like the forgotten sea not far from the witch's forest, not the deadly pale blue of the overseer's eyes a sign that storms were drawing near. Afternoon, Mayor, Ranfast greeted. Herrick looked at the butcher and waved. Have you seen Alistril? No, no sign of the little firehead. Did you lose her again? Did you hear about Noll? Valdir interrupted in his usual severe tone. He went out on a hunt this morning, Herrick replied. Did he get anything? They can't find him, Valdir said. The blood drained from Herrick's face, and a feeling ran up his spine like falling through the ice in winter. What happened? Corden said they found blood and animal tracks leading off to the delirium forest. Noll's wife, Audra, was ready to birth in the coming weeks. Oh, gods, Herrick exclaimed. Oh, well, yeah, anything leading to the delirium forest is probably not good news. That's what I've learnt through my uh, my years. Did it grab you, Ali? <laughs> um, not yet. Um, I thought the blood was competently done and, you know, forbidden magic. It all sounds, you know, it's being unleashed, etc. It sounds OK. It's been done before, but it's, you know, <laughs> still running in it. Um, but no, I, I thought it started reasonably well with um, the characters and the wayward child, etc. And then we got a backstory dump. We, we had a whole pile of, of information we didn't need. And yeah. I also found all of these names. I mean, I counted about six before I sort of slightly lost count, um, within a handful of sentences. And suddenly we had just all these yeah. names flying around, which were unfamiliar. Um, so that I found a bit off-putting. You do um, get that a lot in, in epic fantasy, though, to be fair, don't you? I mean, you kind of the readers expect it a bit. I think so, but not kind of that many all in one go, because there were several which could have been pruned out. Uh, right. And I think I think it's, it is just distracting, and you begin to sort of zub them instead of really connecting with them. You just kind of go. Zip. Um, so I, I found that yeah. um, annoying. Um, yeah. There were quite a lot of deaf brush strokes, and it was competently written. I, did, I thought you know there was a, a good level of skill, as it were, in the writing, but just not in the storytelling itself. So. Mm, okay. Um, well, I don't. I, I usually try to get a feel of um, how my guests are going to vote. In your case, <laughs> I have no idea. Actually, you got from one to five points. What are you going to go for? Ooh, isn't that tricky? Mm. Well, if Sarah's allowed to change her mind, I could vote whatever I liked and <laughs> change it again in five minutes. We have a precedent. So. Yeah, we do. We do. We do. Only once. You get to do that once at the end of the show. <laughs> That's all. Oh, you've just made that up. That's yes, not I fair. did. <laughs> That is not fair. Um, okay, I'm going to be I'd, I'd be somewhere between a three and a four. It, it's competently written, but I'm not thrilled by it. But I don't know. You feel if you can hang in there um, and find out also things like what era it's set in. After a while, he begins yeah. to think it must be in the old days because there's knights and stuff. But it's not clear at the beginning. So yeah. I'm going to be kind and whoa, am I going to go for a three or a four? <laughs> oh, indecision this early on. I'm going to be kind and go for a four. Four. 
Well, well, yeah. I mean, you're in a good mood. You're in a good mood. I was. I was. No, no, no. You said four, and you got to stick with it. There we go. If she revises her vote down <laughs> at the end, every, everyone's going to hate you, and no, and you're never going to get invited back. Oh, I'll invite you back. On. <laughs> dear, oh dear. We, I, we need a Simon Cowell figure, don't we? I'm too soft-hearted. <laughs> Ali, you're our new Simon <laughs> Cowell. Look, I've just given a four. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Thank yeah. you for bringing me exactly. back to reality, Kessia. Yes. And how kind I am. <laughs> um, well, I, I love high fantasy in general, but I'm not convinced this was um, the right place to start. It felt a little bit administrative to me, starting yeah. the, you know, with, with some news that, of something that happened um, off page, as it were. Um, I did like the first line. I thought the man who burned witches alive was a really cool beginning, mm. but then mm. the drama of that was just not really followed through. Um, yeah, and like, I, I think... Um, I feel the same about um, the sort of excess maybe of information about different characters who presumably aren't going to maybe all feature that much in the book um, and a lot yeah. of information about about the war uh, and and sort of the political situation. I just kind of wanted to get uh, into the character and that was mm. the one thing I felt was maybe missing from this. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more actually. So it's going to be a... I think I'm going to give it a three. Yeah. I think that's what I'm going to do as well. Everyone said everything I wanted to say. I'm going to give it a three. And um, I'll show you the collective vote in a moment. Um, uh, it's not, just not the thing is, Brian, it's not compelling enough. You know, I mean, it's up to you. This is your show. It's your show. It's not ours. I mean, you know, if you don't send anything in, we just sit here like idiots for 60 minutes. I mean, and, and it's up to you to entertain us. You've got hookers. You, you know, you, you've got to make it a compelling proposition for the reader. Um, and that's the difference, really, between fan fiction, which is, is kind of, you know, of the readers, by the readers, and it kind of exists at a certain level, and commercial fiction, which has got to make a very clear proposition. Um, and I didn't feel like coming through, hence the three. Let's see what the current score is. And as you can see, it's 50%, actually, of the votes that have been entered. Now, the in in important thing I've got to say, if you're in the chat room right now, please do go along and vote on this submission and on each submission in the show. That's five times. Um, you'll see how to do it. It's very easy. And your votes will have equal sway to anybody else's. Hi, it's Sarah Grant. I'm an author of books like Dark Parties and Half Lives. I also have a younger series for uh, young readers called Magic Tricks. Um, and I have a tip for you. And it's about proofreading and editing your work. Um, the problem writers have, all writers have, is we read what we thought we put on the page. So here are a few things you can do to make sure uh, and understand what has actually found its way onto your page. Uh, don't read for everything at once. I think it's impossible to proof for spelling, grammar, punctuation, as well as character plot. So take your time and read once for character. Read once for bot or subbot, and then go through and do your lined editing, your proofreading, uh, that nitty gritty proofreading that you need to do. Um, also, I find that putting a line in each uh, each sentence, I'm a print out the book at the, la at, at the very end kind of girl, um, and I put a line between each sentence, which makes me stop and read each line, because I think we tend to skim. And my final tip with proofreading and, and, and revising is read it out of order. I will put the chapters, I will print them out, um, and then I will move them around and read them out of any order, because I find that I'm fatigued by the time I get to the end of the book. So the start of my book is really well polished, but by the time I get to the end, I'm just like, I'm reading and editing quicker. So I read things out of order. And if I'm doing a shorter piece, I was doing a magazine article from Dyslexia, and I actually read the paragraphs out of order. And also, again, it's a great way to find out what you've really put on the page. So those are my tips for editing and proofreading. Thank you, Sarah. A lot of tips there, actually. Do what Sarah does, does and tells you to do, and you'll be a bestseller just like her. This is a thriller from Hunter. I'm going to say Hunter Ligore, but I might have mangled that. If there's any danger that I'm going to screw up your name, I will do. So please give me a pronunciation guide. That would be very helpful. I got a QR code there too. Scan that. Go there. Disintegrating Angels. Quite a short blurb from Hunter. Two sisters fake their own deaths in order to escape an abusive parent. Only one is murdered. The other gets locked away in a psychiatric hospital with the killer. 
Mm, okay. Let me tell you about Hunter. Award-winning writer uh, whose work has been received internationally, including Every Life, a 17-time festival winner in 2019-2020. Her story, Equanimity, was part of the Anthem series produced by director Hannah Walker-Brown in partnership with Sony Entertainment 2020. Worth looking for. Her novella, Le Dilmo Polari, was translated and published for readers in Italy 2018. She's writing for the next generation of readers who care about the world. Good. Well, hopefully, it's not just the next generation of readers. Otherwise, we are totally buggered, aren't we, really? Can you say buggered on YouTube? I just did. Um, <laughs> caring about the world... Absolutely. That's something. Desperately trying to find a link here. That's something that our reader does. Yes, it's Robert. The first page. Disintegrating Angels by Hunter. Read by Robert. Jamie. Rave had me cornered against the window. The shatterproof kind and unopenable. Less than 48 hours inside the little ward and I was about to learn who was boss. What side are you on? Rave demanded, holding a pillowcase noose, while shooting me a look that said she wanted to choke me with it. She was bigger and stronger than me, with hair shaved around the sides, the top long and braided, bangs covering up an eye. Other side? I had no clue what she was talking about, and pushed her off when she tried to pin me down. I used to be a softy, a real pushover, but post-incident, I wasn't taking anyone's bullshit. If this girl had it out for me, she had better be up for a fight. Jamie girl, Rave taunted, just tell me what side you're on. She chased me around our room. I used to run track, so made it hard for her to keep up. Over the beds, the desk, the moth-coloured rug that matched the beige walls. I avoided a hardcore stain in the middle. Faded blood, maybe. I'm not on any side, I said trying to figure out what she wanted, hoping it would make her stop. Finally, Rave caught me and put a fist up to my eyeball, saying, I'm not in the mood to be roomies with some shithead from the other side. Was she talking about aliens? It was the nut house after all. According to my parents and the official police report, I'd been in a serious car accident that left me in a month long coma. No real scars, only a small one on the back of my head, even though they believed I was thrown 25 feet through the front windshield over jagged rocks. The newspapers called me lucky. Then a week ago, I woke from the coma and supposedly tried to commit suicide after learning of my sister's death. She was driving the car. My parents kept a watch on me, but when I made a second attempt, it landed me here in the little ward. One problem. I don't remember any of it. Waking up in the hospital a few days ago, I discovered my arm scarred, stitched and bandaged, and my parents telling me this was the best place for me. My dad, especially, insisted I get admitted immediately. No one listened when I denied wanting to kill myself. It just made me look guiltier. See, I'm no longer on the edge of it. Rave gave me an ultimatum. Until you figure yourself out, stay out of my way. She went back to her side of the room. Fine with me, I shot back, crashing on my bed, reeling from a headache. I knew all about being on the edge if she really wanted to know. Rave had no clue that a moment ago I had a family, my mum, dad and my older sister, Blake, that acted like a fortress to keep me safe and impervious to an uncertain, crueler world right outside the walls. Besides my family, my former life consisted of school, which I was good in, and track and soccer, which I lived for, and hanging out at Staunton Beach with my friends, Cara, Fidelha and Dorrit, making French fry chocolate milkshakes and getting sick afterward. On weekend nights it was frisbee races or bonf beach bonfires, and if we were lucky, the guys from school would join us and we'd suck down spiked green juice, not having any cares, and we'd giggle until moonrise about who was the cutest and who we'd want to marry and what exotic country we'd live in and the car we'd drive, changing our answers five minutes later. The rest of the time I spent with Blake, 
the best sister I could ever have. With Blake, life was always vibrant and full, the day always safe and secure. Then in one night, our lives were sideswiped and knocked into oblivion, changing everything. I couldn't figure out how to get it back, but I wanted it all back. Okay. So there's your setup. Um, Cassia, do you want to turn the page or disengage? Um, I, th I think at this point, probably disengage, um, but mm. it's not due to the quality of the writing. I think the writing's really good. Um, I think there's a bit too much of a backstory info dump. Um, so you get all of this information about this accident that's happened and, and also about her um, sort of regular life, um, mm. but set against a slightly confusing um, front story, if you like. So. I, I found the whole sort of argument about sides and who was on what side and everything just sort of distracting. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to start somewhere that was important um, rather than, I, I suppose it's quite similar to the last one in a way. It yeah. does still feel a little bit like yeah. you're edging around what's important in the story. Yeah. It's very difficult for, for writers to to start on the point that readers want to start reading, isn't it? Because writers very often write themselves in. Absolutely, and that's what this this feels like. Mm. You know, just getting a sense of the of the character, um, sort of finding out you know, bits about their life, and sort of putting them in as as they occur to her. That's what it feels like. But yeah, um, but yeah I'm sure it's been through many edits, and that's a very frustrating thing to hear. But <laughs> yeah, it is. Never mind. <laughs> you got to tell it like it is. So, how many uh, stars am I feeling here? I think it's another solid three. You know, it's a good, yeah. there's good writing there. Um, good. But it's okay. not quite hitting the mark. That's encouraging. Ali? I, I entirely agree. I mean, we seem to be starting with a bit of action, but we did end up with a huge piece of info dump, which is, as far as mm. I could work out, just completely irrelevant to what was happening. And if, if some of those things we needed to know, I mean, if we'd had that passed off in dialogue, perhaps started with a car crash rather than a conversation. I also thought there's an awful lot of incongruous stuff. I mean, what is a pillow noose? How do you make a noose out of a pillow? And something I don't want like, to think you know, about it, really. I, I don't know. <laughs> really. I'm a very thick neck, I suppose. I don't know. Um, Oh. And, and things like, you know, running around a room, you know, if you're a track specialist, I don't think that makes you quicker in a small room and, you know, leaping over beds. I, I yeah. don't know. It just, yeah. um, and then, didn't you know, see, the girls. Didn't sit, sit properly, did it really? No. And then no. she said she's on the other side. And then the girl kept asking. And then suddenly the girl, who's massively threatening, then just says, oh, well, figure it out. <laughs> you know, went to a, there are just too many incongruities in there. Um, yeah. And quite a lot of it was just quite cliched. You know, that's what she liked to do with her friends. She'd like to hang out on the beach and, you know, have spiked drinks. And, you know, and her sister was best in the world. There was nothing that was really dramatically exciting. So no, nothing, was nothing the blurb, that compelling. Yeah, the blurb, faking the your blurb own The blurb is the best bit about it. I, yeah, li I, exactly. like, I liked yeah. that story. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, could, I could have got into that, but I didn't feel yeah. it was the same story, really. How many points, yeah. then? I'm going to be... Yeah, I'm going to go for three hearts as well. Three stars, yeah. three whatever. Three stars, aren't they? <laughs> three doodads. We always refer to them as stars, but they are, as you have so anatomically <laughs> described them, they are indeed hearts. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, and me too, actually, for reasons aforementioned. Uh, it's not compelling enough. Interesting setup. Nice narration, Robert. Thank you. But, um, yeah, just sort of summary stuff, telegraph and so on. Whatever Sam Goldwyn said about Telegraph is true. Let's move on to the next one and um, keep our fingers crossed that this might be a four or even five star. My name is Tex Thompson. I'm the author of the Children of the Drought series and a professional book doula. And uh, one hot tip I have for you today is it's a really good idea when before you sit down to edit your work to print out that draft. It doesn't have to be double spaced. It can be, you know, double sided if you like to save trees, but it's really helpful to edit based on the print version of your work um, and make sure that you restrict your writing to the screen. So that way you've got a kind of a nice separation between uh, your, your editing mind and your writing mind, and you can plan your changes out on paper before you try to implement them on the computer. For these and other hot tips, please visit me at www.thetextfiles.com. It's like the X-Files, but it's the text files. Text, yes. Can't wait to have text back. She's great. This is by Martha, Martha Tupper, and it's called Matida 
Not Matilda, please. Read it carefully. Matilda and the Fall of Ophir. It's fiction. And this is Martha's blurb. Have you ever heard of the legend of Ophir? The lost city of gold and its connection to the Queen of the South, Queen Sheba. Well, Cecil John Rhodes and many early explorers believed that the great Zimbabwe and Mapu... Hmm, I'm going to make a mess of this. Mapungubwe ruins were palaces of the legendary queen and many other queens that ruled by her side. Before I bore you with fables of treasure thieves, let me get into my story. I don't think it's going to be boring, is it? Martha? No. The book Matida and the Fall of Ophir is a fiction story of reincarnation of the Queen of Sheba named Matida. Let me tell you about our author, Martha. I'm an amateur writer from Zimbabwe with a passion for storytelling. I'm a mother and a wife. If I'm not writing, I'm drawing or painting. I love homeschooling. My three and a half year old, uh, year old toddler and experimenting with vegetarian and African Indian food. You're saying all the right things for me. <laughs> oh my goodness, you just said vegan and I would be in absolute paradise. Uh, uh, I also love to create fashion designs and illustration of concept art. In short, I'm a hermit that cannot stop creating. You've just described most successful writers, actually. Terrific. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to this a lot, Martha. And um, we've got Emily to deliver the goods. The first page. Matida and the Fall of Ophir by Martha, read by Emily. Chapter 1. A silhouette in a white gown and breeches dashed over the hillside, hurrying past the tree camouflaged homesteads with such haste it set the hounds to bark. The cocks trumpeted the break of a fresh dawn with exaggerated zeal, as if to remind the inhabitants of the mystical village of Ophir how exceptional this morning was. The sun's golden petals had not painted its hues on the stone houses, nor its terraced fields, yet life bustled with unusual anticipation. Women up and running across the vast yard, sweeping and preparing meals for their children. Smoke from the kitchen fires sipped through the round thatch roofs, forming fading familiar shapes in the sunless sky. The moon still glimmered with a silver-grey light ample for the shadow to traverse, but scantily articulating the vivid colours around. Sapphire fields, fields of pink, white and yellow flowers, married with the cultivated fields, married with the granite stone round buildings, blending with an exquisiteness of the balancing rocks. The figure ran past the gossiping girls in wrap-round skirts of unrefined cotton, coming from an early bath at the estuary. Jumping over rivers and creeks, headed towards the stone castle, through a huge arch entrance with soapstone birds, onto of the broad decorated walls with long circular towers protruding out. The silhouette entered the castle walls, running across green manicured gardens, whose only nourishment in the extended dry season were the man-made streams and creeks flowing through it. The nectarine aroma filled the splendid morning breeze with a splendid smell. Up a windy staircase, into the castle, through another grand arch entry, flagged with two big soapstone birds on both sides, and into narrow corridors. The two guards at the entrance stopped the shadow for a moment, then let it pass. Watch where you are, step, a sweet chubby girl in a blue robe fastened on one shoulder shouted, catching a basket with her bare foot. Is it too early for monkeys to see, hey, Kuda? The lady smiled, teasing the boy he apologised, placing the stray basket back on the woman's head before speeding off again. Along the narrow stone staircase up to the third floor, he swung open a massive redwood teak door and walked into a spacious round chamber. Two girls dressed in blue and white robes sat by the fireplace on hemp cushions, plaiting each other's hair. Their beautiful dark faces flickered reflections of the burning fire, adding a glow to their youthful looks. Hair, you are adorning heads on this day. We are fasting, there is no room for vanity. Matida, not the way of a healer. What are you doing? Saru, please cover your head with a wrap. All this is unnecessary, by God. If I miss the ceremony, we shall cease to know each other. The lad stammered out of breath and running. He held on to the heavy door for support with one hand. The other tucked back his stray dreadlocks behind his left ear. Oh, sweet ancestors, Kuda, good morning to you too. Enough time the great horn hasn't sounded. Saru, the dark-skinned with coarse long hair, spoke with a husky, delightful voice. Her big hazel eyes sparkled under long, beautiful lashes, 
and thick eyebrows. Oh, my dear, it amazes me how you're able to get yourself over. The witch hunter's great horn echoed, cutting Matilda short, sending the two girls into a panic she let go of Sarah's unruly hair. The girls scrambled about the room, putting on sandals and head wraps, then rushing down the stairs, trying their hardest to catch up with Kuda. He'd fled towards the sound and was now halfway across the plains. Robes wet with morning dew, Kuda gathered his loose breeches as he scampered to the foot of the east side hills. Large crowds had congregated around the bonfires. More were flocking to the holy shrine of the Earth Mother. Blue, white, black and green robes roamed about. The Emperor, his kings and his advisers sat on the tribune made of bamboo. He wore white and black robes, while his men wore dresses in either black or white robes. Betray and treachery had extended into other realms. Okay, so this is very interesting. What I'm getting here, I'm going to jump in first for a change. I never normally do push myself to the front, being a self-effacing agent, of course. Um, the, what feeling I'm getting here is, is is an extraordinary contrast, actually, Martha, between the voice in in your submission about about you and um, the, the the blurb, uh, both of which I think were really strong. And you came over, um, a very strong voice, actually, very strong voice. Just you know, when you're just letting it flow, writing naturally, and. There's a bit of hesitation or reluctance um, about the voice in in the submission that I found, and I find it a bit stilted. And I'm kind of surprised about at the contrast between between those two things. I'd like I'd like more of your own natural voice in that. But maybe that's just me. What did you think, Ali? Um, yes, no, certainly there were some very strange phrases. It made it very difficult to follow. And some of it seemed to be, um, some of them were beautiful, you know, talking about the golden petals of the sun. I thought that was actually a rather nice image. Mm. Um, but an awful lot of it just made it feel really quite disconnected and and having to concentrate quite a lot harder than I felt you should have to for yeah. sort of like this. Um, some of it I felt was being almost artistic for artistic sake. Kuda didn't get named till right at the end. It would have been quite useful to know who this boy was a little yeah. earlier on, you know, yeah, when he was true. being a shadow, an artistic shadow. Um, yes. And at the end of it, I, I know really nothing about the main character at all, except that he, if it's Kuda, that he can actually run rather well. I know quite a lot about the geography of the building. And I know quite a lot about the day and the sun, mm, and the breeze, yes. but I know really nothing about you you know, the You don't need story to know quite itself. that much. I no. mean, there's an exquisite no. sentence yeah. here. Sapphire fields, rivers of pink, uh, white and yellow flowers, married with the cultivated fields, married with the granite stone run buildings, blending with an exquisiteness of the balancing rocks. That's a, that's a hell of a sentence. It's, it's nicely constructed, but it's kind of dead. It hasn't got the same voice that, mm. that Martha's got in her submission. Mm just my feeling what did you think Cassia? yeah kind of uh, echoing i guess what you what you both said um i i loved some of the descriptive language and i you know at various points i was thinking you know, actually this is really good um mm. and like I'm, re I'm really enjoying just the sort of um the cadence of it all and and the you know any of those various bits of dialogue that feel really realistic and give you a sense of place um mm. but apart from the sense of place i wasn't getting much else and i would have liked yeah. more of a connection to the story or the character. Um, I mean, yeah, basically the same as what both of you said. And there was a yeah. bit of, of, sort of repetition and a bit of, you know, sort of overloading the reader, I think, with, with lots of sensory information when actually less is sometimes more. Yes, exactly. That's absolutely right. And um, I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a, a literal there as well, which is never a good idea to send in, in a submission, actually. It just, it just sends the wrong message, really. You don't have to be dealing with people who are complete sort of anal retards. I mean, the fact is that if there are literals in, in your submission, then people get the impression you haven't really bothered with it. So why should they? It might be unfair, but that's what people think. Um, yeah. So um, what do you think then, Cassia, out of five? Well, I'd be tempted to to give this a four because I think it's slightly better than the other two in terms of the potential. So yeah, okay. I'm going to go with the four. So there we go. Well done there, Martha. What do you say, Ali? Um, I'm going to go for a three. Three. Uh, yeah, a bit disjointed. Okay, I think um, I'm going to go with three two because. I, w I was really full of expectation there. I liked the, I liked your voice a lot, Martha, in the uh, the uh, submission, the covering letter, the bio, and so on. Like it's very direct, communicated person to person. I wanted that voice to continue. You don't need. Sometimes writers think, especially new writers, that they have to adopt a writerly way of writing, and that is 
absolutely wrong because it just it will kill your voice it'll take your voice absolutely out of the submission so there we go let's have a look and see how we're scoring so far the uh, great chat room vote will be added right at the end okay so we're tying at the moment dark cry of aristide and Matida and the Fool of Ophir are both on 50%, but we have a way to go yet. But I think before we have a look at our last two submissions, we should have a word with Cassia, see what's going on for her. Oh, look, this is what's been going on for Cassia. Yes. Um, so Jasmine de Villain, who won the uh, Costa Children's Book Award back in January before yeah. all of this happened, um, is coming out with her second book in September, which I'm really excited about. So yeah. I just thought I'd drop that in get would that happen to, to be a chicken it. house book by any chance it certainly is um and of course i'm jasmine as editor so that's wow. why i'm shamelessly promoting this yes book, which is also well, if you can't amazing. who can actually yes that's <laughs> brilliant isn't that isn't that fabulous um and i mean more good news as well you're a two-time published yes. writer in your own right now Yes, I was uh, just extremely excited to to have my second book out. Um, Your first book, of it's, course, we're uh, bound it's by been stars, a weird time, so. Go on. very weird time to be published, but um, just... but yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah. So this is another uh, standalone YA fantasy. Um, you might be familiar with my first book, which is We Are yes. Blood and Thunder. Um, this is set in the same world um, with a new set of characters, so you don't need to have read the first book to understand the second. Um, and it is a tale. Ali. Yes. Oh, yeah, Shut dumb. Go me. on. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> She's got it. She's got it, folks. If there are any dumb bits in the show, I'll be reading along, sir. <laughs> ah, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. How do you feel, Cassia, when you discover a new manuscript? What, what happens in those first few words, sentences, paragraphs? What goes on? Um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's tricky to say in the first few words but sometimes with the first chapter you kind mm -hmm. of feel instantly that you've you've found something really special um it's really exciting when it does happen Isn't it? um and of course that was kind of the way with um with jasbinder's first book asher and the spirit bird which i plucked out of our uh, times competition pile which is a it's a competition for yeah. unagented unpublished writers yeah um so the equivalent of a slush pile i guess um yeah. but yeah i just instantly knew that it was it was really really special her writing was really different um and it needed work but just you want, what, just, what, yeah just want to press you on that what you say you instantly knew describe that sensation i think it's just it's a gut feeling you know when uh, you it's almost like yeah. when you're when you start a movie that you kind of know that you're yeah. going to love like within even you've just seen the opening credits but something about it something about the music or the way they've chosen to present the the credits just makes you think i don't know i always get this feeling anyway it makes you instantly think i'm me gonna too. love it me too yeah me too that's where you're trying to get to writers you're trying to get uh Cassia to feel just like that and it, uh, it's it, she's not the only one I mean agents feel like that too when they discover something special and it's it's what we live for actually it's yeah. what we live for so this is your second book are you going to carry on and do more hopefully yeah I mean I'm writing something very different now sort of a mm. product of lockdown I think that I've had to sort of diversify a bit in terms of genre yeah. so I'm writing something that's a bit scarier and a bit more contemporary as well so okay. um very interesting to see where that goes i'll keep definitely you posted. definitely um you published from seven to ya it's quite a big range yeah. um what about illustrations we often get submissions um, some, uh, with illustrations do you how, how important are they when you look at a manuscript I would say not important at all because we usually commission illustrations separately. <laughs> so yes. it is, it's rare for us to pick up. I don't think we ever actually have picked up an author who is also an illustrator and have them, you know, both write and illustrate their book. I mean, it happens, but um, I think particularly for picture books or that sort of early readers stage. Um, mm. Whereas I think once you get to seven plus, they are novels and often the illustrations are quite guess anyway and usually just yeah. black and white so it's just yeah. kind of not quite that area yeah but um yeah. but yeah certainly have huge admiration for people who can even 
remotely illustrate <laughs> their work. Yeah. I can't imagine having yeah, two such amazing too. talents. <laughs> so to a lot of unpublished writers, I mean, the publishing industry seems like some sort of bastion you know, sort of fortress publishing with huge great high walls around the outside and do not, do not, you know, keep out signs, basically, do not disturb us. So uh, how, you know, what's, what's your best advice to an unpublished author who wants to get the attention of an agent or a publisher? Do, do you accept direct submissions? Do you encourage them to do that? You've just had this competition with the Times. Give us some encouraging yes. words. Yeah, I mean, with, for all children's writers out there um, writing for that age group, 7 to YA, um, definitely submit to the Times Chicken House competition. It's annual um, and it's open to everyone as long as you're not represented by an agent. Um, or only for the unrepresented. Children. Yes, um, oh. yes, because it's a fixed um, kind of uh, prize, I guess. And also yeah. there's a particular, I suppose, if you've got an agent, you can go in the usual way. You know, you can always yeah. get ask the submissions to us anyway so it's just an, it's an alternative route designed yeah. for those people who can't you know who feel that they can't get an agent or haven't got one yet or yeah. for whatever reason and we are looking at manuscripts with potential so it's it, it, we're a bit more open to the idea that we're going to have to do more work so that's one thing mm. and i think also you know the industry is more open than it looks you know join to, join twitter join you know all the various different groups that are out there, such as um, Utopia or uh, right. or Write Mentor. Um, you know, there's there's lots of different groups that yeah. you can join to kind of get advice uh, and you know share your work with others. Uh, yeah. And basically, yeah, people do find success in those ways. So, it's possible. Yeah. It's possible. You just you just need a bit of deter determination, really, don't you? Yes. Good. <laughs> That's fantastic. Very uplifting. Thank you for encouraging us all, Cassia. Um, let's have a look at uh, our penultimate submission now. And it's from Donovan. It's called Son of Anger. And it's historical fiction. And this is Donovan's blurb. I'll just turn my page over for a sec. Ulf is one of a long line of famous Norse warriors. His ancestor, Tyre, was no ordinary man. In Norse legend, he was considered the god of war. But Ulf knows nothing about being a warrior. Everything changes when a stranger arrives on Ulf's. Ulf's small farm in Vikenford. The only family he's ever known are slaughtered. And the one reminder of his father is stolen. Ulf's father's sword. Ormstonga. Ulf's destiny is decided. The gods are roused. One warrior can answer to them. The son of anger. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know why I'm laughing. She'll be angry. Uh, thank you very much, Donovan. Let me tell everybody about you. Originally from South Africa, I moved to the UK when I was 14, where I developed my passion for history, particularly the Dark Ages. And I've been a keen historical fiction reader for many years of authors such as Bernard Cornwell, Simon Scarrow, and so on. Currently, at 33, I live in Moscow and work as an English tutor. That's all very good stuff. And what's even better, I've got Chris to read it. The first page. Son of Anger by Donovan Cook. Read by Chris Ugai. Olaf held his axe to his side, his shield in front of him. His knees bent as he constantly shifted weight from one foot to the next, ready for anything. The man before him wore only a faded tunic and loose fit and trousers, armed with a spear and shield. From the way he held his spear, it was easy to see the young man was not an experienced warrior. The young man stood rooted to the spot, his legs stiff like the roots of a tree, while he looked for a weakness in Olaf's defense. Even though Olaf was a farmer, he had been a warrior once. He had felt the crush of the shield wall and hot spray of blood as his enemies died in their own shaken peace. Come on, boy. You're going to attack or wait for me to die of old age? Olaf provoked the boy. You scared of an old farmer? The young man screamed as he attacked, aiming high with a lightning fast spear thrust. Olaf ducked low behind his shield, not having enough time to lift it. At the same moment, he launched forward onto his oncoming attacker, punching out with his shield as soon as they collided. The reverberating sound startled the cows as they grazed in the nearby field. Birds scattered from the barley they had been feeding on, screaming their discontent at being interrupted. The young man grunted as the air was knocked out of his lungs and was sent sprawling backwards. 
Olaf smiled as he watched his nephew lying on the ground, gasping for air like a fish out of water. The boy lacked skill, but he was fast. He could be a fine warrior, as his father had been. Bjorn had been a great warrior, the champion of Jarl Thorgils, the Jarl Olaf had once served and who ruled these lands. His nephew Ulf, Bjorn's son, looked a lot like his father, but he was not as tall or as wide. He was still young, though, only sixteen or seventeen winters. He would grow some more. Thor's balls, boy! Enough! Olaf roared as Ulf attacked again. He deftly stepped aside, using his shield to deflect Ulf's spear jab. Olaf kicked Ulf in his exposed side, sending him sprawling to the ground again. Before Ulf could get up, Olaf planted his foot in his back, pressing him to the ground. Ulf tried to twist and turn, hoping to free himself, but was not strong enough. The more he tried, the harder Olaf pressed. Eventually, Ulf gave up and just lay there panting like a dog in the summer's heat. His anger and energy burned out. Although Olaf knew it would return. It always did. Good boy. Olaf removed his foot. Let's get cleaned up for dinner before your aunt flays us both. At least he kept hold of his spear this time. Olaf thought as he watched Ulf pick himself up from the ground and walk to the stream which ran close to their farm. Almost skewed you there. Olaf turned to the worried voice of his wife Brynhild, who had been watching from the doorway of the lawn house. Never even close, he lied, examining the edge of his axe instead of looking at his wife. Don't like you using real weapons. Makes it more realistic, Olaf replied. And if you don't manage to get out of the way in time? She crossed her arms as she stared at her husband. Olaf only shrugged, not wanting to have this argument again. He won't mean to hurt you, but accidents happen she said, softening her voice. Maybe it's time we let him go on his own path. I don't think being here is doing him any good. We've played our part since he lost his father, Brynhild said, walking over to comfort her husband. He was a good man, but he was blinded by his devotion to his brother. Still, Olaf said nothing, preferring to watch their daughters chase butterflies in the tall grass than face his wife. Oh, yeah. Well, not the only one, I suppose. Um, yes, so thank you very much, Chris, for that. And let's see what that did for Ali. Um, well, some bits I like very much. I mean, I think any book that um, has a sword that has a name, that sort of, that gets me to, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, to engage in that I point. completely mangled that name. I still can't say it properly, actually. What is it? No, it's um, sure. Ormstunga. Oh, Ormstunga. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's got to be good. Um, I also think he did um, well to give, although there were quite a few complex names, he, he chose names that people would, would recognize, like Olaf and Bjorn, uh, which just made it feel Viking, but read easier. Yeah, um, there was <laughs> Viking light. <laughs> yeah, like Viking esque. Yes. Um, there was, there's an awful lot of telling in there. Um, there's there's such a lot that could have been tidied up neatly and and just presented rather a lot better. And it also seemed very strange that we went from what looked like a piece of action and then turns out it was actually a fake fight into yeah. a domestic scene. You know, he seemed to be a bit worried about his wife's reaction. You know, and you suddenly think yes. we just virtually dropped all momentum at that point. Yes. Um, and the point of view seemed to flip around a bit. We actually had the birds' point of view at one point. We knew that they were um, <laughs> <laughs> they were upset at being or distressed at being um, moved on. So that's true. So it, it's that's it's true. an interesting concept, but I just I think it started in the wrong place and and lost any momentum it had. Yeah. So Barbara's saying in the chat room, the genius room, as I, as I am want to call it, because <laughs> they are geniuses. <laughs> Uh, Steve White, right. just before Barbara says, a very old kind of story, very traditional, deep roots in folklore. Barbara says, I'd like more character and less action. Several people agree with that. Johnny, a bit too much of this training. Well rendered, not, not a lot happening. Nice sense of family, says Kate. A few cliché similes in there, like fish out of water, panting like a dog. But on the whole, Martin enjoyed it. Let's see what Cassia thought. I thought it was good as well. Um, I think I would have liked, uh, again, more of a sense of rootedness in the character, yeah. um, more of a fixed point of view, and possibly um, for the stakes to be higher, perhaps simply by withholding the information that this is a fake fight for a lot longer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that would have been much more exciting. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the, I guess we don't have a sense yet of what the stakes actually are for this, you know, the sort of training scene, like what, what's, what's wrong, what, what could go mm. wrong and what could, yeah. um, you know, 
what, what you want a sense of like the peril in the first page don't you, you want a sense of like Indeed. how this could go wrong so yeah i think that's kind of what's missing but i thought it was really yeah. well written and i like the sound of the story overall the sort of tale Good. of vengeance yes absolutely um so um how many points are you going to give it i'm going to give it four points yeah. four from kessia is not bad i don't think that we're going to get the same from ali are we <laughs> <laughs> Despite the named sword, I'm yeah, going for This is why you didn't get invited back for about six months, you see. This is why. Well, Cassia obviously didn't upset them. <laughs> Cassia gets invited back a lot. <laughs> uh, great. We'll have a little talk afterwards, Cassia, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going for three. three. Upset them, I will. Yeah, no, actually, I'm going to go for three as well. <laughs> You won't get invited back now. No, I probably won't get banned from my own show. Ah, never mind. Yeah, it's, it's genre writing at the moment. It's all right. Um, it's genre writing, I think, actually, Donovan. Um, which is fine, and it'll find its market, and people who like reading this kind of thing will read this kind of thing, you know? But um, I, I would be looking for something... My ideal sort of bestseller, really is something that does have a genre and you know it's going to find its base market it's going to find its core market fantastic it's going to sell a few thousand or whatever to that market but it's also got potential to break out you know to the so-called general reader if indeed there's such a thing um but it's just got you know mass market potential it's got the ability to say you don't normally read sort of norse fiction but this is one you're going to really like and you just you just have to look through the bestseller list for, for years and years and years to see that's that's happening i mean you know scandi noir whoever reads scandi noir well it, it broke out because it had huge potential to do so so yeah um a three from me let's see what the uh, the voting situation is like before we add the chat room and oh it's all quite tight isn't it <sighs> everything to play for actually for every submission including our last one which is just about to experience it It's Fat Boy, and it's from Joseph, and it's dark comedy. I feel like some dark comedy. Oh, I do. Um, there's an OCR code there, so you can um, you can scan that, please. Do I mean OCR? I mean QR. Um, this is Joseph's blurb. Way out west, in the tumbling greens of England, something's going down. Fat Boy is a treacherously fictitious rhapsody taking a tongue-in-cheek look at the best and worst of humanity and treating it with the disrespect it deserves. Love and hate, corruption and extortion, car chases, gunfights and hijinks. <laughs> it wasn't like that in Norfolk for me. All the, Perhaps it is in Kessia, I don't know, she lives in that part of the world. All set against the green and pleasant landscapes of the English countryside. It's a circus, a raucous ride into the unknown. So I'm not totally sure what the story is, but I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it. Let me tell you about um, Joseph. Here we go. Um, Joseph Cobb was born at Chase Farm Hospital, Enfield, on January the 3rd, 1992. It's rumoured that when Mrs Cobb gave the final push, the drab winter clouds parted and the miserable faces of North London basked in an unseasonably warm flush of sunlight. Oh... How poetical. Uh, he bears the holy initials JC. Is this the beginning of a cult? Um, Joseph has a strong background in screenwriting, having written and directed five highly acclaimed short, uh, short films. Fat Boy is Joseph's debut novel. It's the culmination of years of hard work, instant coffee, ugh, and self-torment. The life of the writer is not easy, is it? But we will make it just a little bit easier for you today, Joseph, because we've got Martin to read it. The first page. Fat Boy, written by Joseph Cobb, read by Martin. Tokyo Burning, Goof Troop, Devil Child, that's what they used to call me. That was, unfortunately, just my parents' label for my hell-raising attitude towards infant life. Others addressed me by far worse, considering I was just a toddler in the front seat of a supermarket trolley. Though I did used to growl at them as they neared. My name is Rainer, but everyone calls me Bert. I'm not sure how or why it started exactly, 
but that soon became my name. I never knew my grandfather. He died years before my father's sperm were even stretching out for the big race, and I therefore never had a male rail role model or a father figure in my life. I mean, I did have my father, but he was an absolute bastard of a man. So maybe that's why I turned out to be such a bad egg. Or maybe it was due to my mother booming all 36 chambers of Wu Tang Clan as she attempted the housework while I sat in my high chair inhaling R-rated hip hop. Life moved slowly through most of my childhood years, subjected to my mother's resentment and rarely seeing my father for his everlasting work commitment. God only knows what unholy truths that phrase covered up. My dad was an elusive and shady fella. His suppressed ethics nudged him towards family life and providing a loving home for his wife and children, but his many demons shoved him towards the competitively priced girls lit up in red above mad sandwich bar off the strawberry way roundabout. He had his problems, his addictions, but he kept them hidden from us, a choice I've never really understood for such an openly corrupt individual. We knew what he was and what he did, but my mother Brother and I seemed contented in his absence and privatised hobby hobbies. For we never discovered the bad he could have inflicted had he been a more consistent part of our family. Bradford-on-Avon was where we lived. It's a twee little town, about half an hour outside of Bath in the West Country. It's a quiet place, mostly. My brother Jack was three years older than me and he was my superman. We were close whether it was down to our shared experience of a mucky upbringing or just the fact that we were so alike. But either way, or both, we were dependent on each other. We weren't always troublemakers. There were times when we tried to be good and provoke an affectionate welcome from mum and dad, but we were persistently shot down. So we tended to act up, sometimes a little too much. Anything we could conjure up to upset them was seen as a great triumph. Mum got the brunt though she wasn't one to roll over and take it. She'd give as good as she got. The infinity ring of stubbornness perpetuated by both sides was what caused, or heavily contributed to, the mani maniacal aura shrouding our crazy cottage in one of England's most beautiful neighbourhoods. Contrary to the classy decorations inside our home, my mother was a woman of simple pleasures enjoying a glass of anything strong enough to submerge the pain she felt about her family's disappointments. She would meander around the house, killing time and all consciousness, slowly eroding her once treasured happiness. Oh, how she meandered, never changing pace nor pattern, but always glaring at my brother and I with a look of woe, and above all else, fear. I first noticed my mother's fear when I was ten years old, Jack and I would play outside from the moment we woke to the moment we were called in for yesterday's tea. We would explore and adventure whenever and wherever our imagination took us, which was usually just past the second farmer's field adjacent to our neatly kept garden. We would make camp, hunt for treasure, toss rotten fruit at the farm animals, whatever we wanted really. As long as we had each other, we could accomplish almost anything. We never did, but it was comforting to know that we could. Is it indeed? Is it comforting? I don't know. I'm not sure I drew comfort from that. Um, and we're going to find out about the, the truth about life in the West Country in a moment um, from Cassia. But Ali, uh, did that grab you? Uh, no, no, unfortunately it didn't. It seemed a, a slightly strange piece. Um, all the focus seemed to be on the, the other characters, on the mother and how bad she was and the father and how bad he was. And, and seem, grandfather walked in only to walk straight back out again. He didn't seem to hang around to, to do anything. Yeah. I thought there were some beautiful turns of phrase. I loved, I mean, this concept of you could com comfortably accomplish anything, but you never did. Um, yes. and, being and the big and race, yes. I like that. That, 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 that got my <laughs> yeah. attention. Yes, as it, as it would most miles. I think yes. Yeah, and th so you've been called in for yesterday's tea. You know, again, it, it's quite a deft brushstroke to to paint. You know, the family nice. chaos. Um, yeah. 
I, I, there was no hint of where we're kind of going with this story about what's about to happen. Um, and I also felt it was a fairly generic family. We have an alcoholic mother, we have an absentee, very badly behaved father, and two wild kids. You know, we, we haven't got anything really radically interesting yet. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not invested in the, the main character. I don't have any feelings towards them at all. I couldn't describe them other than yeah. resentful. <laughs> you know, that would be the overriding. That's, that's right. You know, that's what Barbara said. Mm. Right at the top, mm. just about to scroll off. Barbara said, oh, right. I'm not mm. getting humour yet, just resentment and some sadness. Mm. Yeah. And I was looking forward to, you know, the grand finale. Dark humour, really. It's sort of a dick punch, really. Yes, I was, I was really looking forward to that. But um, but still, I don't know. Typical of life in the West Country, Kasia? Well, I don't think so. I used to live in Bradford even actually. So Did quite you? Well, that. you should know all about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, it's very quaint. It's true. Um, yeah, this for, for me, um, it wasn't funny enough to sustain no. the lack of story or drama. It, it felt a teeny bit self-indulgent on the part of the yes. writer, possibly just a way of getting into the voice um, yes. and maybe later on, a bit more structure and story will appear. But I, I did find myself, uh, my attention slightly wandering um, mm. because we don't need the whole family history on the first page. It just, it's just too much. We can't, we yeah. can't focus. So I think but the just, thing is, it's amazing. Yeah. Sorry, to, it's amazing how many submissions do start like that. Actually, you think that's oh, just yeah. another one? Yeah, just actually, another one. I think it's, mm. it's where it's, you start, you know, chronologically at the earliest point you can possibly think of and actually you should start where the story starts um so yeah those words writers of cassia should be engraved tattooed on your heart so that when you die and they take your heart out for an anatomical observation let's see the <laughs> words of cassia lupo those are absolutely vital words how many uh, how many points there uh, cassia i think i'm gonna give this two two <gasps> Yeah. Of Cassia, who is the eternal optimist, actually. She's giving it to. I don't think I want to know what Harry's going to say. <laughs> I don't be like that. <laughs> I said I liked some of the turns of phrase. Um, and, you know, and it was confidently smoothly put down, although there were quite a lot of grammatical errors, which tripped you up a bit. Um, I, I, I'm somewhere between a two and a three. I'm, I'm not sure I'd be unkind enough for a two, but I'm not sure it quite reaches a three. So I'm going to say three because I'm feeling kind. Three, yeah. And I don't know. It's very difficult for me. Um, I'm, I totally agree with you, actually, Ali. Um, I think the thing is, I, what I often feel when I get excited about, about a pitch is the corresponding disappointment is so much sharper. You know, um, you just feel it harder. So I think probably I'm going to go for it too as well. I know. I wanted it to, to be a bit more than it was. And it probably will be, actually, Joseph, when you've had a, a good revise of it or workshop or something like that. The thing is, I don't know why, you know, so many of the, the submissions we've seen today, perhaps the majority of them, sort of make this... It's really, really simple, basic mistake that you know, millions of books out there and courses and you name it, and they they all sort of start off by giving us an info dump. You know, maybe that's not the best way to start a piece of writing, but people still do it. Why do they do that, Cassia? I think, you know, like we've, we've all said, it's writing your way in. It's, uh, you know, sometimes you need to do that for your first draft and then you can go back and figure out where the story starts. So it's perfectly understandable. Mm. But, um, but yeah, but I think it's just draft, one of those things. Yeah, it's a first, first draft, draft thing or draft zero thing. That's yeah, where exactly. I always start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. That's terrific, actually. Kessie you should, should be back next week and the week after and the week after that. Ali... <laughs> <laughs> oh, come along. <laughs> hey, it's not my decision, guys. It's up to Rachel and Kate, okay? The other book is not me. Let's see how the thing, how the uh, situation looks like. We're right at the end. Kate has been fantastic, and she's added in the chat room vote. Let's see why we... We got two winners today, folks. The Dark City... The, the Dark Cry of Aristid, 65%. Average out amongst all our votes. And Matida and the Fall of Ophir also joint first how interesting that is um now this is i'm calling this the um the sarah grant rule just um for a moment to go through the submissions of had dark cry from william 
better known as Brian, Disintegrating Angels by Hunter, Matida from Martha, Son of Anger from Donovan, that was the Norse one, you remember? And we've just seen Fat Boy from Joseph Now. The crucial question here is, Ali, are you going to change any of those words? Am I going to sorrow it? Yes, um, <laughs> but you can only go up. I'm going to impose that rule on you. <laughs> so I can't fling in a big fat zero somewhere. No, well, um, you can. <laughs> no, you can't. Yes, you can. No, I think I'm going to stick where I am because um, I, I would agree that those two probably came out top puppies. Um, okay. Matida, I think, had much more poetry in it and much more... Um, um, yeah. Possibly potential, but actually, uh, uh, Aristid was actually a lot yeah. easier to read. It was more of a. But story. you're not changing. So you're not twisting. I'm not you're changing. holding. I'm, you're holding. I'm not Got staring. It. Staring. Okay, fair enough. Kesha, you're going to twist or hold? I, I'm going to hold as well. I think those are the, the two worthy winners. And although I like Son of Anger as well, um, I can see why that wasn't maybe as accessible as the Dark Got it. Cry Got it. of Aristid. Fantastic. There we are. That's how things stand right now. We don't know how things are going to stand this time next week because it's up to you. Yes, please go to latopia.com slash vote. Uh, it's right at the top of the screen. You'll see, you'll see all the individual votes further down, but don't bother about those. Those are closed. The big one is still open and will remain open until 12 noon next Sunday UK time. Thank you, everyone. We got through another show. Thanks to you for sending in your submissions. Uh, keep them coming, please. As many as you want. We love them. We love them. We love writers, too, on the show. We really do. What would the world be like without writing and books? Not worth living in, really. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're writing out there, we're behind you. Uh, thank you so much to Kessia. Isn't she fabulous? Ali, isn't she amazing? Yes, amazing, Ali. Uh, the geniuses in the genius chat room who give so much, actually, and so accurate they are. Our book is Rachel and Kate. Thank you, our narrators, our writers. Please, please leave a little comment on YouTube as well, if you'd like to. If you saw something you really like, just leave a comment. It will mean everything to that writer concerned, I promise you. Uh, see you same time next week, and don't forget to vote. Good night, everyone. and words, callous words, trying to drive a wedge between us, lonely mornings, secret codes, I just gave up keeping the score, slander of liars, nothing can stop us baby, this is a time, 